first change dimension, covered. Let's take a look at Google Glass. They have started selling them in the US right now, so everyone wants to buy them. You've got 15,000 Rand lying around, spare cash, you can purchase one. And this is how it works. Here are the basics of how to use glass. This is your touchpad. It runs from your temple to your ear. Tap the touchpad to wake up glass. You should see the display above your line of sight. Adjust it to see everything. The home screen shows a clock. This is your timeline. It's a row of cards. Things to the left are happening now or coming up, like the weather, an upcoming flight, or an event in your calendar. You can tap on any card to see more. Swipe down anywhere to go back to the timeline. Cards to the right of the home screen are from the past. For example, messages, videos, or photos. Tap on a photo to share it and choose one of your friends. Swipe down to go back to standby and have fun exploring. How much did you say it was $15,000? Yeah, wow, well, the current one. Take a look at how Fujitsu and SAP is using wearable computing in that niche market. So the question is, will this be the Apple Newton? Nice technology, but not really um, widespread use. We don't know yet. Take a look at what is happening in Germany. This is live, by the way. This is a, a live one. Or um, a true manifestation of how it works. Welcome. The time is 6.47 a.m. There are people first to line the door. Begin. Incoming people first. For customer 351, 22 items, please confirm. Confirmed. Show me the pick list. Go to R17, show 3. Show item 1. The size for item 1 is 30 by 25 by 5 and the weight of 0.5 kg. It's not fragile. P2. There's a breakdown, there is no standby technician. You simply wire, hook up to a technician. Hey, how are you doing? Be sure to set it to DC. What's the voltage? Okay, reading 12.3, 11.9. Just put both tubes together and you should be fine. Nearby. So for intro sake, what a lot of guys are now looking at is to take a look at augmented reality to do training. When you want to train mechanics, they put it on and then you tell them, this is what you need to do, take that off and then that. So your training now gets uploaded onto your glasses. And if you take a look at the engine bay of a car, it then gives you the secrets. Take that off, then that, then that, okay, next, do that, next, do that. And there's your entire sequence. Done. Hmm. Well, if you, if you want to name it that, just far more flexible. Um, they, Audi, have just launched uh, an augmented reality app for the A3. So you can take your phone, point it at any part of the car, and it'll explain how it works and what to do, and if there's a breakdown, what you need to check for. So you simply take your phone, hold it over reality, and a new reality is unlocked. So that's one of the things about velocity. It takes reality around us and just enriches it so that we can interact with it easier. One of the interesting themes behind philosophy. So. Philosophy being done, let's take a look at granularity. Granularity is also one of the foundation elements of big data. We'll speak, talk about that in a moment. But in South Africa, the guys have started playing around with a model to redefine insurance. So right now, we're tracking technology. We can determine how a person is driving around a bend by looking at a, a second per second measurement. We can find out if it's going around the bend too slow or if too fast if the foot is off or on the accelerator. 
then your driving behavior is compared with a variety of other people in a specific and a, and a normative measurement. And then based on that, we can depend, we can determine how you're driving. So the older model was really about we create your premium based on how old you are or where you stay. Then we started moving to how often do you drive. So if you drive on a Friday night and a Saturday night, your premium goes up because 50% of accidents happen between 6 and 12 on a Friday or Saturday night. So there was the older models. Then people started saying, hold on, now we can determine where you drive and depending how you drive and how fast you drive, we can then set up your premium. The, the model being pioneered in South Africa is a behavior-based model. We say, this is how you drive, you're pretty bad at these elements here. If you improve your driving, you get a reduction in your premiums. And that is the, the model that motivation, the discovery one, have implemented about three years ago. So now we can see how business models are changing now that we have the ability to measure things minutely. The idea that we can change data and uh, use them interactively has also changed the ecosystem. I'm going to give you three stories based on that one. But in South Africa, in the Northern Cape, there are cows that have been part of the internet for the last 10 years. Take my word for it. As the cow comes in to be milked, there's a tag on his ear. And as it comes in, we find, hello, Bessie, hashtag 7421. Give me your stats today. Oh, Bessie, hashtag 71 weighs the following, 512 kilograms, giving me 48 liters of milk. And if Bessie deviates from that standard, I immediately know Bessie's not feeling well. I then get, get the vet out and we either do preventative maintenance on Bessie or turn Bessie into 1,000 packets of Biltong. We have barcodes in every one of them. So the idea really behind it is that everything gets connected to the internet, even cows. They, they, they even have chips that the cows can swallow. It was previously only the Proteus chip that people could swallow. And then on the one side titanium, I think the other side copper, there's enough uh, voltage differential in your stomach and acids to power it. It communicates to a patch that you stick on your stomach and that communicates to your phone. Or you have these figures on the TV set, for argument's sake. And your wife would come in and say, honey, our stock portfolio is not looking good. I'm saying, no, that's my tummy assets. I think there's an inverse correlation between the two. But the fact of the matter is, I can measure my blood flow, my tummy assets, by swallowing a chip. My stomach can become part of the internet. We looked at a couple of solutions a couple of years ago for um, uh, some guys in the distribution environment. So there was a gas canister company, Afrox. And they had a problem because they outsourced their entire distribution fleet. So individuals to harness job creation and small company growth, they outsourced their distribution. And people that come up, they load the canisters and take it away and people would be paid for that work. Unfortunately, they picked up the wrong canisters and dropped off the wrong canisters at the wrong locations. We created a nightmare in terms of invoicing because now you have to get the canister back and take it to the right location and send the invoice and scrap the invoice and you know the story. So we came up with an idea where you would have RFID tags. Now, RFID tags are similar to your access cards. You, you all say those are access cards? Yeah. Yeah. So if you swipe your access card, there's a transmitter in the device. It sends out a signal. It powers up a capacitor inside the card, retransmits, and gives its identification. And we could put that on, on a number of these gas canisters. We would then have them in the yards, the readers, of where they have to be distributed, as well as on the vehicles. So the moment you stop, we have a GPS geofence around you and the moment you take the wrong canister off the truck a red light goes on you take the right one a green light goes on as you take it into the yard where it can be stored immediately the invoice is generated and that means you have quality at the source even with an outsourced distribution network another interesting example is the choice where companies roll out movies so traditionally a company would say oh here's an action movie it traditionally did very well in the following cinemas because if you roll out the wrong movie in the wrong cinema you missed opportunity to generate revenue so it's about perfect matching between different audiences and the movies that you roll out so in the past they rolled out the movie based on historical um, trends and then they carpet bombed everyone with radio and TV and newspaper advertising that this movie is available close by so go and watch it what they do nowadays is they allow people to look at the trailers on their mobile phones. And then people respond on those trailers via Facebook or Twitter. And as they respond, we get a geotag of where they are. So now you take a geospatial map, you take that data in a geospatial format, and you pop it on top of each other. 
And then you take a look at where people have negative or positive attributes towards the trailer. And now you know where to roll out your, where you roll out your movies. So the big data play is all linked to granularity. There's elements of value that we get from the environment which allows us to make better management decisions. And that is granularity. So with the speed of wireless networks, with devices being everywhere, we can record everything. And because we record everything, we can see new patterns. Remember this. With the explosion of the, of the amount of nodes that are linked to the internet, and the anticipation is that we will have a hundredfold increase between now and 2025 about the number of things that are connected to an internet address that we can verify and that are connected to each other. But a hundredfold increase in connected devices give us a 10,000 increase in patterns we can recognize. And that means that the big data play is on the way. That through this, we can start recognizing patterns of behavior that will make our businesses more efficient, which is part and parcel of the next discussion. The Internet of Things is also important. That means that not only are devices connected to the Internet, but they become carriers of the Internet signal as well. There are technologies like Zigbee, for example, which means that you can put all of the tech devices in a specific environment and it hands over its signal until it reaches the base station. So it's a kind of a hop over mesh network. Effect. Family, foreign regions, create hotspots. Uh, no, because it's all linked to ADSL lines. Uh, that's a, another interesting model, but the mesh network <coughs> is that you, each device isn't connected to a base station. Yeah. They connect to each other and hand over the signal yeah. until it reaches a base station. That's a mesh network. Now, what's interesting here is that they've gone so far as to put internet addresses on grapevines. In the Napa Valley in California, you can now do independent analysis of how much moisture each plant is <laughs> taking up. And they even give internet addresses to grapevines. If you, if you think giving internet addresses to a cow is, is far-fetched, they even do it to grapevines. So they tell you exactly where to harvest for the perfect bouquet for, for wine. I won't be able to pick up the difference. They're rolling this out in farms, so we get things like ultra-wideband uh, technology which they drop as small transmitters on farms, and now on your iPad you can track where your cows are. So because ultra-wideband low uses far less energy, uh, and its, its reach isn't that far, but your battery life is therefore far longer. And you can now uh, track all of your livestock in real time on your iPad, through your own communication network and mesh. So just some interesting analogies. The third change dimension, uh, I don't know if you want to make any comments, Mike, on the previous two dimensions. Yeah, just that, that uh, we, we're seeing it's, a, it's both an, a huge opportunity and a challenge for our business. We, we invested uh, $10 billion in a company called Autonomy uh, a couple of years ago to do, to, to look at uh, both what we refer to, I don't know if you structured and unstructured data. Um, and that's, that's where we're putting a, a great deal. And we're being asked by our customers to, to bring thought leadership and innovation to them around unstructured data. So we went out and we acquired this company. And, and so it's, it's figuring out, you know, how do you apply some of those concepts? And it's, it, it does another thing is that from, from an infrastructure standpoint, we talked about the expansion is that, and it has to do with cloud and storage is the manipulation and, and trying to extract knowledge from, from a mountain of data that these, these new algorithms and programs are, are creating. It's just, and it's having far-reaching social implications. There's a, I heard a, a, just the other day that uh, one of the uh, National Football League teams um, in the U.S. is now uh, attaching, experimenting with atta attaching probes to uniforms of their players, and they will monitor and measure their performance. So, you know, whether or not if someone who does uh, the 0 to 40 and 4.1 is now running at 4.7, you check their temperature, maybe they're not feeling well, time to supplement. And when you're paying 20, 30 million dollars for a player, you need optimal <laughs> performance. And so then I'll start to measure sure. that, which is some, causing some people to freak out a little bit. But that's, I mean, I think you'll see that in athletics, yeah. right? With it, it's great you want to command a huge income to be a football player or a rugby player or whatever. You know, then, then we need to know what your performance is down to the, that granular level so that we know, what, you know, are you really the optimum player? Are, are they going to get hit up this play soon to say, this is the play right now, or throw the ball over it's, there? It's know, coming, no, no. you know. <laughs> it's up to play. Enhanced decision making. It's, well, and, and yeah, the, the, the extreme from that type of technology, um, 
my son's a systems engineer on the new strike fighter, the F-35, that the U.S. is rolling out. And um, some of the technology there, that, you know, he, he, I don't know about it. He, won't talk, he can't talk about it. Um, but a few things have become unclassified where heads up, you know, maybe think of heads up display. So now a pilot in the latest fighter aircraft can see 360 degrees um, all, all around because the, the aircraft is mounted with um, cameras that tie to the movement in the head. So if they drop a bomb, they, they, even though they're flying over, they can look back and see the impact. They can see right through the plane. Um, just all kinds of amazing. They can also follow the bomb. I saw the uh, pre uh, preview of the movie once where they actually they switch over to the, the, the bomb's camera. So yeah. They, they shoot the bomb and then they switch over and then they can actually follow it until it actually hits the ground. But it's pretty unbelievable to sit here in an aircraft, you look at your feet and you can try to see right through it. It's like the new Land Rover. The new Land Rover Discovery, you can see through the bonnet. So it's got a, a display at the front and if you, if you drive over a rocky, so if it's rocky, then you can actually see through the bonnet to the ground and everything because it's also got cameras mounted underneath the car and then you can see through it. Interesting, amazing. interesting play. Um, they've launched a track suit for about a thousand five hundred dollars in Scandinavia, and it's an invisible track suit. Uh, I tweeted about it. Uh, so it has fiber optic cameras at the back and in the front, and you will see someone coming to you, but it's an invisible person. It, 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 you just see those blur. It's very weird. So um, interesting. But um, I picked it up about three days ago. This invisible track suit they're selling in in the Netherlands, um, in the, one of the Scandinavian countries. So if you have 15,000 rand lying around, you can either get glasses or invisible tricks. <laughs> so, so the story of the emperor whose clothes were not uh, visible is... <laughs> one of those things. Have you seen this model before? It's called the business model canvas. This is, a, um, a, a, this is the result of a collaboration between hundreds of people around the world which created this model to explain how a business model would work. Namely, looking at certain customer segments those customer segments being defined by a certain value proposition. And the value proposition, so the client's being served by customer relationships and channels, and this is your revenue as it comes in from your client. Over here, we're taking a look at the key partners, the key activities, and the cost structure, as well as the, well, the cost structure is then supporting this. Take a look at the business model canvas on YouTube, that's your homework as well. And take a look at how the business model canvas is being utilized to create business models. I think on uh, YouTube you'll find how they looked at Nestle's various models and where they used a different business model for the, the Nescafe brand as to the Cappuccino brand. Completely different business model. You'd think, whoa, is that really worthwhile? But it was linked to the unique value proposition requiring a different set of capabilities in order to um, reach the targets that they set out to do. One of the key premise in the world of, of concreteness is that most of the companies, if you compete here and you are a serious player, your cost structure in the same market space will look relatively the same. If you haven't got the efficiency, efficiencies patted down, it means you're open to um, competitive threats. So most of the acts of production has reached a level of maturity in most economies. What is the next challenge, however, is understanding why people buy your products. And that's why I want to hook up to Mike and ask the following question, what do you hire a milkshake to do? <laughs> so, and that's directly linked to what he, he mentioned. So, who heard the story before? What do you hire a milkshake to do? Okay, interesting storyline is that one of the fast food chains in America, who would think that you'd talk about milkshake when discussing ICT strategy. Mm -hmm. huh? So one of the business school professors were asked by a fast food chain to find out how the, they can sell more milkshakes because they, ha they have nice margins on it. Put some milk in it, some ice cream, you put a flavor in it, and you mix it together and you sell it for a high price. And they wanted to figure out how can we sell more of this stuff. So let me ask some questions, you know, without you going in depth into it. What would you recommend they do in order to sell more milkshakes, to make it more profitable? How can they sell more milkshakes with a target to become more profitable in that line of business? What would you recommend? And be careful of your answer, because I might just rip you to pieces. Make the milkshakes smaller, they might buy two. 
Make it smaller, yeah, but then they'll go to the competitors. They're saying, oh, hold on, you know, this guy's ripping us off. The, the There's more flavor. Add more flavor. So what you want to say is expand their range by increasing your input costs and your carrying costs associated with it. Um, we'll get more revenue. Well, a fast food joint is all about fast people getting through it. So you, you, you run out of certain syrups quicker than others. Your stock keeping is a challenge. I hear you, but I'm not, I'm not sold. Make a competition out of Drinking milkshakes. Gamification. Yes. Uh, difficult one. So come in and slurp your milkshake the quickest and get another one free, type of thing. You lose money in the process, but you might get some more money in. Okay, I, you, you have to write a business plan. I'll, I'll look at it. Why don't you look at also, uh, just like how you get, you know, uh, cokes and, and, and chips coming off these machines, why don't we have a milkshake machine? All right. Normally they do, but they just hand it to you. But it is one option to look at distribute it elsewhere. What I want to ask, and, I, and it actually boils down to the following: What do you see as a replacement product for a milkshake? Coke. I can see my esteemed uh, audience here. Most people say beer, but I'm, I'm glad you said Coke. <laughs> a glass of milk. What else? Ice cream. Ice cream. Does it? Yogurt. Any dessert. Okay. What we as humans do is we immediately fall back on a part of our brain. We create a schema to understand the world around us. We put things into categories. The moment I take a look at a milkshake and I say, give me a replacement product, what do we do? We say, well, it comes in a glass. It's wet. We can drink it. It's cold. It's sweet. So let's take a look at anything that has similar characteristics and then try and match those characteristics as close as possible to that categorization we've done. Wrong answer. Let me tell you why. You see, when the business group professor sat down, he said, let me just sit down and try and understand why people buy milkshakes. So there was a blip on the radar, a bit more sales early in the morning, here before 7 o'clock, 7.30. He stopped a few guys and said, so why do you buy a milkshake? He said, well, I'm stuck in traffic. And while I'm stuck, I just quickly pop in, grab a milkshake, join traffic again, and it ties me over until breakfast. Aha. Uh -huh. Now that I know why they're using the milkshake, why, why do I hire a milkshake to do? It ties me over until breakfast. What's the replacement products? Muffin. Muffin? A muesli bar. A muesli bar, a chocolate, a fruit. So that becomes the replacement product. If I therefore have to compete in that space, tying me over until breakfast, what can I do to sell more? Instead of having a diet milkshake, Let's put more sustenance in the milkshake. Let's put extra energy, energy or let's put uh, a bran in it. Because fiber. that fiber, a fiber milkshake, because that serves the need better for why the client wants to use it. In the afternoon, another blip on the radar. The guy said, so we stopped a few mommies and what we started seeing is mommies are coming in with their kids. Mommy, can I go to the moon? No. Mommy, can I date Angelina Jolie? No. Mommy, can I have a sleepover with Fred? No. Well, we can I get a milkshake with my hamburger? Yes, I mean, you can. So it was seen as a kind of a, uh, you know, a, a, what, what would the correct wording of it be? But giving the kid a break and just giving him a treat so that he feels happy. You don't have to n negate everything he says or suggests. But then the kid sits there with his massive milkshakes and slurps through the mommy is getting tired and wants to go home and the kid is still there slurping the milkshake. So what is the reason why they purchase a milkshake? It's to keep the kid happy. So one of the options the guys looked at is mommy would come in and said, so ma'am, would you like a normal milkshake, a normal adult size milkshake, or would you like the kitty milkshake with a free toy for the same price? And the mommy said, yeah, 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 give me, give me the smaller milkshake with a toy. So it's really that simple. You buy a 10 cent Chinese toy, half the milkshake size, and you sell it for the same price. Beautiful margins. By understanding what the acts of consumption is, we can therefore far better create value in this ecosystem. It also is directly linked to what in our hyperconnected world. So the message is acts of consumption. How do people consume it? What do they consume? Not what we produce. So it's not about acts of production. And the model is really here is a bottle of water. Go and buy it. That's that's most manufacturing. We we buy we build something. We sell it. What if we say I'm not going to sell it to you? but I will charge you money for drinking out of it. So if I give you a glass, if you drink water out of it, I'll charge you five cents a sip. If you drink whiskey out of it, I'll charge you a rand a sip. But that's my model. 
the glass remains mine, you will just pay for usage. Now most people say, whoa, that's an interesting model. But that's exactly what companies like Zipcar have been doing. In places like London, Paris, most European cities, access to personal transport traditionally meant having to buy your own car. Now, you simply take out your phone, you say, where's the closest car? Oh, there's one, 400 meters away. Oh, please book it, thank you. Go up to the car, open up the car with your phone, click, climb in, start the car, drive around, book. When you're finished, click a button, pay for it, walk away. In Paris, you can even have pre-booked parking spots. Now, you know how difficult it is getting parking in Paris. They have zip car parking bays. So you'd rather drive with a zip car because then you know you've got parking. And you don't have to pay license fees, you don't have to pay petrol, you don't have to pay insurance, nothing. You simply pay for the usage. Now take a look at one of your most expensive assets, your car. What's the percentage you use on a daily basis? You use it half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the afternoon. Uh, and so this massive... 50% of the well, <laughs> there, are, there are exceptions. There are exceptions. But now this is a far better utilization of that asset. I must concur, it wouldn't work everywhere. You need a, a good supporting backup system for it. But for that level of freedom in a big city, wonderful option. And it really means that the companies now manufacturing it don't need to make their money by selling cars. They say, fine, I'll give you the fleet, but I'll take, you manage it, but I'll take 60% of the, the revenue that we get from it. So you now make money every time someone uses your car instead of simply selling the car. We are seeing a change because information is now everywhere. We are seeing a move away from ownership to access. We're seeing it with Airbnb, with drives, with Lyft, with Uber. Um, all of these information constructs is shared equally amongst each other and it makes the environment far more efficient. That's part and parcel of what we're seeing in the world around it. Any comments you want to make, guys? Just jump in. That, that would obviously impact the taxi industry. Oh, yeah. It's also impacting housing. I'm familiar with Airbnb or um, so in uh, homeaway.com where you rent rooms in your house or rent your house or your apartment or your flat. That's become so shared, shared even for the homes. They're very popular. Same concept. But more importantly, it's provided, like for instance, what the, you said it impacted taxis. Um, most taxis in the United States, they work with, let's say, like a yellow cab, yellow taxi. And the individuals lease the car yes. from, from, the, from the taxi company. And um, some of these guys, if you talk to them, they say, look, I work 12, 14 hours a day, and I only made $100 today, or $80. Um, but what was the, how much did they make in fares um, was, was dramatically higher, but they had to pay for the use of the car. And a lot of these guys are sitting at an airport in queue waiting for passengers and so on. Going to a model where now you're getting an alert um, that uh, you, know, you have a fare to pick up makes you more efficient, but it also enables the individuals now to become uh, like with Uber. They become private contractors themselves and they're making far more uh, money that they're keeping. And they're providing a better service to, um, to passengers because if you look at, if you've ever been in the United States, the taxis are not the nicest. You go in Europe, they, they use um, you know, Mercedes and so on. The, the cars in the United States, they tend to be run down. And here now, these individuals that have gone into business for themselves, they're offering a better uh, product for consumers, yet they're also making a higher uh, living. So it's a win-win for everybody. And, and we've got one philosophy that says transparency equals quality. So if you go to Airbnb, which we'll talk about in a moment, and you go and stay over and you leave the place like a pigsty, you will never ever be able to get access on any Airbnb accommodation ever again. Or the other way around. If the accommodation is below par, people just vote for you. So the transparency in terms of vetting creates quality. And the same with Uber. And a variety of others. Now what's really interesting is that we live in this modern world yet we are stuck with a, a first generation brain. See our brain with the reptilian brain and the animal brain and then the human brain, uh, those, those brain stems has got different reactions to the world that we're in and if you think that humans react logically to the world 
that they live in, you're making a massive mistake. So we need to understand, and that's why anthropology is such an important field of study, because in a way, a deeper understanding of the human brain guides us into choosing the right types of business models which would have a higher chance of adoption. So I came across some fascinating insight. This was a, an article written three years ago by Reuters. They asked uh, some leading journalists around the world, or, or sorry, scientists, what they deemed to be the most beautiful theories out there. And one of the theories that I came up with was research regarding a part of our brain called the basal ganglia. And this was done at the Salk Institute which did the polio vaccine. So what the guys have realized is that this part of the brain called the, called the basal ganglia constantly monitors the state of your brain. It says, is your brain in a happy state? Is it? And based on that state of your brain, it would then influence your purchasing decisions. Now what influences the happiness of your brain? In a big way, dopamine release. So what releases dopamine in your brain? Novelty. A lot of the older generation would read newspapers in the morning. You know, I, I can't get going without knowing what, what's happening in the world. And your brain feels good because, hey, now you've got new information. Or when it's 1 o'clock or 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock in the morning, you tune into the news so you can get that new, fresh information. So novelty drives it. Research has shown that listening to certain types of music releases dopamine. Falling in love, hey, they say for about four weeks you can sell anything to someone that's in love. Uh, they're just dopamine bombs. Um, then they, um, they looked at gambling. <coughs> the variability in what you would get would, would then create dopamine releases. So every time you pick up a hand, that's why people are playing bridge. And Sorry, can I yeah. just add something to that? Now that you talk, I just told um, uh, Keith Knapp over, over lunch, my wife sells semi precious stones and jewelry that she bought from India on Bilibar. And Bilibar is like eBay in South Africa. But one of her customers is a psychologist, and she said to my mom, listen, I'm, I'm not going to buy so much anymore. I'm trying to control myself because this is like gambling. It's like that. Uh, uh, oh, there's a new stuff. Putting that bid on and, and waiting and see if somebody else is going to outbid you. That, uh, so, yeah, what you're saying is uh, I can. I can. <laughs> so, what car salesmen do is that they don't talk about what the engine does. They, they focus on the things that the client isn't aware of. Oh, you click this little button, then the dashboard goes green. If you click it, it goes blue. And click it again, it goes orange. Like, oh, that's really cool. And you say, oh, look at this little thing. You pop it open, and there's a place to put your coins. Or do this, and then this opens up. Or press that button, and then you can. So what we're seeing is that people are driving the novelty factor. And what your brain does is says, you know what? I, I like it. I'm going to buy it. And then you make the buying decision. What's interesting now, I'm going to ask you a straightforward question. Why did you buy the exact car model that you chose? Why did you buy that car? Why did you marry the woman or the husband that you married? Why did you buy the house that you're staying in? I know I don't want to create any conflict here or, 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 or personality <laughs> conflict, but the decisions we made weren't based on rational thinking in most cases. Um, and, and sometimes sometimes we make a decision and now we have to justify our decision. The moment you ask someone, so why did you buy that car? A different part of the brain then kicks in. Now you need to construct a logically sounding reason to explain your actions. Otherwise, they think you're just cuckoo. Oh, I like the color. I'm sorry, that's not a good enough reason. Um, well, I, I felt good, so I just bought it, which is really what happened. Um, but now we construct a storyline, and now we, we think of what other people think of it. So why did you buy that car? If it's fuel efficient, you say, well, it saves me fuel. Why did you buy that car? No, you know, it's a status symbol and I deserve it. Or why did you buy that car? No, it's all about its eco-credentials or whatever crap you can think of. You will come up with a logical explanation of why you purchased it. You lie to yourself without you realizing it. You construct your own reasons why you did something. And if someone later on asked you why you did it, you will, re you will re repeat exactly what you did the first time. You explain it to yourself. Which is why market research is sometimes dubious. Because you are getting the, <laughs> the information from someone which, which is creating a reason for why they made a certain purchasing decision. But what we are seeing is that dopamine plays a very big role. And the, and the, and the basal ganglia plays a massive role because if your brain is in a happy state, the purchasing decision is actually made easier. So some fascinating insights into how that works. And understanding that is very, very important in part of the value proposition and how we ensure that 
the concreteness of the value proposition is influenced. Ernest Dichter is coming back into vogue. He was in vogue in the 60s, then he's out of vogue for about four decades, and now he's getting back in. But it said, you'd be amazed to find out we mislead ourselves, regardless of how smart we think we are, when we, explain, when we attempt to explain why we're behaving the way we do. And the research at the Salk Institute goes a long way into explaining. Paku Underhill, his book, Why We Buy, very, very good insights in explaining the underlying consciousness of why you as humans make certain decisions. That's not based on rationality. Understand that. Okay. I've mentioned uh, in, remember, in my fourth slide, I said, remember, guys, uh, all trade names will get to virtual dimension. You never called me out on that one, did you? Well, let me explain what I mean. You see, in the near future, we are going to start getting a virtual dimension linked to logos. So take a look. What do you see on the screen? A dragon. Now take a look at that same dragon through the lens of my smartphone or my tablet or whatever for that matter. Let me just put up the data. Uh, screen quality. There you go. Do you see what happens to that picture? Wow. Now imagine a range of clothing doing this. You can start a brand of clothing. And in the morning when the kid goes to school, you want to take out your phone and says, what are you wearing today? Same thing as yesterday, but it's a new logo. You, um, when you want to give a 10% discount, in South Africa, discount vouchers is not big. But take out your phone and look for the three hidden characters in the box. So you chow your breakfast and now you use your phone and you look at all the hidden things. Because you're bored. You're sitting there eating breakfast. So you can take out your phone and now you look for the hidden characters on your... Think of all brands. You can do a treasure hunt in a shopping mall. You take out your phone, look for the 10 hidden characters and find all of them and win something stupid. Uh, and then win a 10% discount voucher. Normally you wouldn't use a discount voucher because you see it as a rip-off. If someone says, here's a discount voucher for 10%, you're, you're pissed off. Because your reaction is, oh, if I didn't have that, I would have paid 10% more. This is a rip-off. But if you have to go and search for something and create extra effort, and you get it because you've done something for it, then there's a higher chance of you using it. So understand that certain logical things will not work out the way you plan unless you understand how people's brains will work. And unfortunately, it's also dependent on different cultural sensitivities. So it's about testing it and trialing it. What happens or what works in one geography might not necessarily work somewhere else. I don't know if you guys want to jump in on anything from Okay. Yep, I'm good. Okay. So, let's take a look at density where the real fun begins. In any value chain that you create, there's a sequence of activities that follow after each other. So, from writing a loan to what, and that's the, the seminal work of Michael Porter. Took a look at the value chain and said, these are the activities that you need to put in play in order to do it. Your strategic positioning within the value chain, how you play, what you do, how, what, you, what parts of the value chain you control, what you don't control, what you outsource, what you insource. The challenge that Michael Norman, in his, or Richard Norman in his book wrote, was about how do we take these elements within the value chain, have them unbundled, how can we unbundle them, rebundle them in order to give high density. So how can we optimally utilize all the elements in our ecosystem so that we can provide a better value proposition than was possible before? And the best example I have on this is a company in Israel called Shahal Shahal Medical Services. Now these guys have got a specific model where they look after people with heart problems and diabetes. What's the very first thing you do when you get a heart attack in South Africa? What's the first thing you do? Guys, they should teach this at high school. What's the first thing you do? You call the pizza delivery company. <laughs> right? You say, I go, just bring me a white pizza. Then you call the ambulance and say, follow the pizza guy. Then you know they're there within half an hour. Right? <laughs> if they're not there, you get the pizza free. It's called the win win situation. <laughs> so um, when the ambulance finally pitches up, they'll then pick you up and charge you a fortune to take you to the hospital. You'll pay five times more than a five-star hotel. They'll send you ugly nurses and pretty nurses. You pay the same rate. They'll send you good doctors and bad doctors. You pay the same rate. Um, and sometimes you die and sometimes you don't. You're still going to pay the bill. 
So the model is, you get the heart attack, we try and help you recuperate. If you're lucky, good, you owe us money. If you don't you survive, money. not so good, but you still owe us money. So that's the model. And what these guys in Israel do is slightly different. They give you a monitor to wear around your arm. They try and determine what type of heart ailment you have, and then they detect what your heart rate is. So they monitor your heart rate. The moment there's a deviation in your heart rate, they pick it up, they record it, they send it to a centralized say, station, and then they compare your heart rate to other individuals that had similar heart ailments. Then they pick up and they say, oh, hold on, this guy's got a 70% chance of getting a heart attack. They then dispatch an ambulance. Not from close to where they are, from close to where you are, because they position the ambulance as close to where it's needed. A guy comes and knocks on your door and says, hello there, Sue, please come with us. We think you're going to get a heart attack in half an hour. And you say, hey, it's the all-back Springbok game, you know, come back later, Sonny. He said, no, don't worry, you know, take this little, move, this little drifter device and you can follow the game on the way. The thing is that they either stop you getting the heart attack, or if you do, you're in the best possible hands if you do get it. And that means a fundamental redefining of the business model. You see, everything changes. In the past, your digital value chain had a capability where the physical product and the product information which was embodied with it were tightly bound together. But now in a world of RFIDs and internet addresses and everything around us, I can access information about a different physical location and product without being there. If I had an RFID tag reader in that door, and I have RFID tags in this bottle, I could tell you how many of these bottles are in here. I could tell you how many of them are. I can tell you who else is in here. I can tell you what other products are in there. I can tell you what the valuation of those products are. I can tell you what the ecosystem is. I can tell you where the nearest place is where I can reply, supply. So I can create far more value now that the product information is abstracted. And that's the reality we start living in. We are now living in a space where information is no longer bound to the product, but abstracted. It means information is everywhere, and it changes everything. It changes the time, it changes the place, the actor and the constellation. Where, when do you get the heart attack? Before or after you go to hospital? Where do you get it? Who's around you, your dog Fluffy or a team of experts? What machinery is around you? Your internet router or some sensitive heart detection machine? all based on our ability to make a relative estimate of what might happen in the near future. What we are therefore seeing is that the product is in a larger way being disembodied from what we have due to the technology we have. One of the densest devices we have is this. And by linking this to one or two other constructs in the ecosystem, the amount of value we can create is unbelievable. This is where the future resides. This is a dense value proposition on its own. Now connect this to other devices and to everyone else and to one or two constructs and you create density. That is what we're trying to create. Take a look at what's happening in South Korea. South Korea, they don't have time to go shopping. So what Tesco have done is to say, okay, if people don't have time to go shopping and they don't have time to do online shopping, let's take pictures of all the products we have and stick it on the walls in our subway station. So all you have to do if you want to do shopping is you take your phone, you take a couple of pictures of the product you want, and as you snap them, it's purchased. And as you arrive home, your shopping is delivered. That's how you do shopping in South Korea. The second most productive country in the world, they don't have time to go shopping. They are blessed. Anyway, this is now so successful that this model is now being rolled out into the supermarkets itself. So you come home at 10 o'clock at night, and your wife says, so where were you, honey? Oh, I went grocery shopping. So where's the groceries? No, I went to the grocery, and there wasn't any products that I wanted there, so I just took pictures of it all. It's coming now. Don't worry about it. Yes, you can do so in South Korea. You can take your phone, and you can take pictures of things, specifically shampoos and so forth, because you don't want to carry it with you all around. And ta -da, that's how you do your shopping. Uh, three years ago, we did a, a wish list in Canal Walk. Had these big walls, and then you had a QR code next to the products that companies were promoting. And all you had to do is you take your phone, you go QR code, snap, 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 and you create your, your wish list, your Christmas wish list. And it, it, uh, I think it was a bit too early for South Africa. <laughs> but um, getting gift lists underway, that's what they've been doing in South Korea. What can we do in the South African context? Well, firstly, what about finding a store close to you and then having ability to create your shopping list by simply scanning the barcodes. About 15 years ago, I gave strategic advice to, to Pick and Pay. I said, in the future, you should buy um, 
garbage bins for your clients. And the guy said, why? I said, it's really simple. You have a throwaway bin and a replace bin. And everything you want to replace, you put in the replace bin, which scans the barcode, and then it just replaces it early in the morning. You know, yeah, they've got this delivery service. So, ta-da! Well, it's far cheaper doing it on your phone. You open up the pick and pay app, you go, scan, 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 thank you. You open up a book with a recipe in it. You simply scan the QR code of the recipe, click, and all the ingredients magically appear on your phone. As you enter the, the shopping center, with in-building navigation, I can now say, okay, navigate me to where I can find it, best shopping route. And there you go, walk, simply walk through and pick up all the things here. How wonderful. I've got pod mom seeds, and as I get close, it says beep, okay, it's close here somewhere. Oh, thank you. And I simply put it in the trolley and there I go. So that's one way of doing shopping. You can upsell your basket, for example, by scanning a chicken. And then say, oh, there's five chicken recipes which the social network really likes. Click on one, here's the other ingredients you need. Add it to your trolley, thank you. So now you can upsell your basket by giving more information. Very simple, not difficult to make, and you can create a far nicer shopping environment by simply using these elementary ideas. Do you understand now how this dense value proposition in your trolley can be utilized to change shopping behavior? and limit frustration. We've spoken about Airbnb. Similar model is relay rides and wheels. I don't know how successful they are in the US, um, where you can now get uh, a ride from one location to another location, get a lift, mm -hmm. and they rate people accordingly. So don't, don't drive with this person. He never brushes his teeth and keeps on crying when you mention his ex-girlfriend. So not a good partner to have on a long journey. What we're also seeing is human mashups. Similar to the model where people are, create, are taking their own time to, to benefit society at large, you have individuals that create earth-moving equipment out of scrap metal, and then they upload the blueprints on open source ecology. So on that website, you can get the blueprints for any of those machines and build them for the fraction of a cost. So if you've got nothing to do over weekends, you can build your own um, forklift or whatever else you're interested in. So part of the open source ecology. Who's at a freelancer.com? I had an IPO about three months ago. It allows you to look for white collar projects, the outsource white collar project. Let's say you've got a software project. Now somewhere, someone around the world has done something very close to what you want. You put it on freelancer and they come back and say, in order for me to do this for you, it's gonna take you a week, it's gonna cost you so much. And you say, yeah, cool. So you can now get white collar work by outsourcing it on freelancer. There's pros and cons, but you now can tap into expertise around the world of someone that had done something similar. So check it out, it's quite interesting. I'm actually thinking of using them for one of my smaller projects. Rolling out my um, designs and say, guys, I want feedback. At the innovation agency, we went to level nine for our um, a logo design. Now, normally you'd go to a graphic designer, a graphic designer will come back with three or four tries, each time she'll give you about five or six examples. You wouldn't really feel warm and fuzzy about any one of them and you'll settle on one after three weeks because it just takes too bloody long. On level nine you go and say, okay guys, I want, um, this is my brand, that's my purpose of my company, I want a design. The one that's closest to the design I will pay $200 to. We had 300 designs coming in within 24 hours. We chose the one we liked, we paid for it, and we walked away. That's a new way of doing work. This one is currently on, got a lot of interest, and specifically in New York's financial circles, um, crowdfunding and peer-to-peer -peer lending. In Africa, you all know the Stockfell model. The, the Stockfell model in South Africa means that there's 10 people, all of them contribute a bit of money to their collective uh, savings accounts and then once a year someone in the stock fell withdraws the money and uses it for either starting a new business or buying something but the, the money is always within that contained circle there's no new money coming in it's always the money within the circle that is exchanged in Europe Plum Place America what is the what's the interest you get on a bank deposit 0.5 percent 1 percent if you're lucky See, these economies have so much debt that they can't raise the interest rate. <laughs> Keep on printing money in order to make sure the interest rates are nice and low so debt can be financed. Uh, that's one theory. Um, uh, and harnessing or stimulating economic growth. But 
if you go to these guys and say, listen, I give you a 99.5% chance of getting your money back and an interest rate of 5%, think of it. In Africa, small loans, what do you pay for a small loan in Africa? 30%, unsecured loans. Per month. Per year. Per, per year. month. Well, that, that's the unregulated space. It's the industry I service. It depends on how small you It's the industry I service. Yeah. And take, take a look at uh, some of these smaller banks, ABLE, which yeah. have got an impairment that's rocking them because of the strikes the guys it had. It takes not far beyond it. Uh, so I'm not putting my money in there. <laughs> so unsecured lending, massive problem. But the problem is that there is no recourse in terms of ensuring that the money that you lend out will be paid back. What these guys are ever do is they tap into these social networks. They say, hold on, I will provide money to you as a group. And if one of you doesn't pay back, the whole group loses out. So we know who you are. And if ever you go, so transparency provides quality. So we will give you access at 8%. They take a nice 3% cut. Because of the stock fell, you know, mindset, you make sure that if that one in your circle doesn't pay back, the others will actually fill in for him and sort it out amongst themselves because they don't want to be cut off from funding. But now people in Africa get access to money at 8% per month, per year, instead of 30% or whatever other figures the guys really pay. Whereas the guys in Europe now get 5% on their money. So what we're seeing is peer-to-peer -peer lending and um, Zopa being the leader in the field. And you can actually track anyone and take a look at their payback, their rating, what, what they pay back, and you can then decide, I want to give money to this group or to that individual, and you have a rating on their payback scheme. Really interesting, peer-to-peer -peer lending. And then fair, uh, currency fair, one of the services that allows you to swap currencies without those exorbitant exchange fees between parties. So some websites already playing that game.